flesh, that we should live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death to deeds of the flesh, you will live. For whoever are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now you have not received a spirit of bondage, so as to be again in fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by virtue of which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself gives testimony to our spirit that we are sons, but if we are sons, we are heirs also, heirs indeed, and joint heirs with Christ. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. There was a certain rich man who had a steward who was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear of thee? Make an accounting of thy stewardship, for thou canst be steward no longer. And the steward said within himself, What shall I do? seeing that my master is taking away the stewardship from me. To dig, I am not able. To beg, I am ashamed. I know what I shall do, that when I am removed from my stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. And he summoned each of his master's debtors, and said to the first, How much dost thou owe my master? And he said, A hundred jars of oil. And he said to him, Take thy bond, and sit down at once, and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much dost thou owe? He said, A hundred cores of wheat. He said to him, Take thy bond and write eighty. And the master commended the unjust steward, in that he had acted prudently. For the children of this world are in relation to their own generation more prudent than are the children of light. And I say to you, Make friends for yourselves with the mammon of, of wickedness so that when you, fail, when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting dwellings. That's the words of the Holy Gospel. Please be seated. Friends, please take home a copy of the bulletin. And I was asked to uh, inquire with you, if you have not received the bulletin by email, then we need an updated email address for you. And just to make things a little complicated for you, as if your lives are complicated enough. The email address here is changing. So uh, we're going to, and furthermore, we don't know where the next next Sunday's Mass is going to be. It's kind of like a game. You stay tuned to your email. We send it to you. If you don't get it in a reasonable time, look in your spam folder for something that looks like St. John Bosco Mission or SSBX or something official. And then that's how you'll know when to come uh, to Matt, where to come with Mass, and there will be a prize. <laughs> well, it's usually given out right there. Okay. Friends, in all seriousness, uh, aside from that, uh, I'm very, I understand that there will be some folks praying at the abortion clinic after this Mass. Uh, it's very much a pleasure for me to be back here in St. John Bosco. Uh, most of you probably don't know me, but I am uh, Father Sentimo, I'm from Florida. And I uh, live most of my adult life in San Diego. So this is very familiar to me. But the last time I was here, you were in the Navy base chapel. So uh, I had to ask where you were meeting to and get the secret password and everything else. In any case, it's very good to be back. <laughs> no servant can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold on to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and man. St. Luke's Gospel. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. A certain priest and pastor of a fairly well-off parish uh, once told the story of a cocktail party to which he had been invited by one of his parishioners. And as the evening was winding down to a close, some of the guests uh, were preparing to leave. They were uh, saying their goodbyes. They were thanking the host and moving toward the door. And uh, the host, in turn, uh, when one of them, one man was leaving, simply, we might guess, making conversation, uh, asked the man where he lived. And the man told him. And then he added somewhat gratuitously and with an air of 
superciliousness, I guess. It's a gated community. Well, then about that same time, the host five-year-old son was there while he was up at that hour, I don't know. But he heard this little interchange, and he said, a gated community? Why won't they let you out? Well, that funny little story illustrates one word that might be used as a key to unlock our scriptures for today met, today's mess. The depths of their meaning, the gospel of the Episcopal. That word is perspective. Perspective, how you see things. You see, uh, our little story, uh, the perspective of the prideful guest was that the gates of his housing community were a good thing. It was something that protects him from the riffraff out there that can't otherwise get in. But to the clear-eyed vision of the child, the five-year-old child, there was something else entirely together. They were a prison, having him in, which was right. We could decide. Our blessed Lord spent three years on the earth teaching. He was trying to impart to us the divine perspective. And in so doing, he spoke much about wealth, the subject of today's gospel. Um, about the, the things that we do treasure and the things that we should treasure. And the context of the good God's eternal plan for our lives. Now, at the very onset of his public ministry, uh, first of all, his first sermon, the greatest sermon that was ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, how does he begin? With the Beatitude. What's the first beatitude? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Another word for this poverty of spirit is detachment. And that's a beautiful quality, a very necessary virtue. Later in the same sermon, the master extolled almsgiving, provided it's done for good reasons and without fanfare, good motives. And he directly addressed our human tendency to feather our own nests. He says in that same sermon, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where rest and moth consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither rust nor moth consumes, nor thieves break in and steal. For where thy treasure is, there also is thy heart. That's Matthew chapter 6. And of course, we can remember many similar teachings of our Lord along these same lines, including the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, who was sitting at his doorway every day, but to whom the rich man gave no food, not even a crumb, and the door the dogs licked his sores. And also the encounter with the rich young man, whom our Lord invited to be one of his followers, but went away sad. Because he had many possessions. Today's parable of the unjust steward follows in just this same vein. And if it offers us a valuable perspective regarding our stewardship of the good things that we have been entrusted with. Here we have a man who works for his Lord, and he is called to task uh, for wasting his employer's goods. And while he hasn't done a good job for his master, he's going to be fired, he winds up doing a very good job for himself, as it turns out. Very self-oriented, and he did what, what he needed to do to make sure that when he was let go, that people would still think well enough of him to let him into their homes. And the rich man, uh, what does he do? You know, he, he writes down these bills of his master's debtors, uh, probably cutting into his own illicit profits is the best guess we have. And they're all happy with that because they thought they owed a greater amount. And the Lord of the manor, the rich man, commends him, not for his underlying financial shenanigans by any means, uh, but rather for making friends with the mammon of wickedness, so that they might receive them, so they may receive him into everlasting dwelling. So let's break this down and see what it means. When we place things in true perspective, who's rich? Only God is rich by nature. 
To him belong all the stars and the constellations, the earth and all that's in it, the beasts of the field, everything that swims in the ocean, all gold and silver, anything that you can consider to be of value is God. He's the creator. He's got dominion over all things. And by sending his son into the world, he provided him an heir of all that he has. So he, God, is the rich man of this parable. To him belong the heavens that proclaim his glory, the oceans whose surging waves sing his songs, the earth which gladly offers him its fullness, all are subject to his rule. Now man was created and given dominion over the whole world. Man, therefore, is the steward of this parable. Now after the fall, we know very well that God placed into motion a plan for our redemption, but not simply to absolve us of our sins. Uh, no, the divine plan was to elevate man far beyond his mere human nature and to give him, if you can only conceive of it, a share of the divine nature. That's what St. Peter says in his epistle explicitly, a share in the very nature of God. So instead of being God's slaves, being brought into a, you know, just a, a standoffish, arm's length, okay relationship, you know, like the United States and its European allies or some such thing like that, uh, he would have us become his brothers in Christ. And when he ascended from this world to his father, whom he had made uh, also our father by the grace he infused into us, he sent us the Holy Ghost that would bear witness, bear testimony, by enabling us to cry out, Abba, Father. In the Aramaic, it's more like Daddy. We have that feeling of relationship now. We may seem like we're a million miles away because we don't see God, but in fact, if we're in the state of grace, we're sons and baptized sons and daughters of this great God. How tremendous is this blessing? Think of it. What's the, the expanse between God and ourselves? We're mere worms by comparison. And yet we're joint heirs with Christ of the ineffable riches of the world to come because we share the divine nature by participation. The beatific vision, communion with the saints, total bliss. That's what's held out for us. But, we knew there would be a but. In order to share these, these eternal riches, there's a condition imposed upon us, and this is what this parable illustrates. That our future reward in heaven is dependent upon our faithfulness. Among other things, our faithfulness in employing uh, the shares of the inferior goods of this life. Think of it, everyone here has been blessed with something. Some of us have a certain degree of money, or skills, or time to help others, or something like that. We all have something that we might consider as riches. We have been blessed with something. The question is, do I treat these good things of the world uh, as my sole possession, as ends in of themselves, uh, or rather, do I use them as a means to an end, that end being uh, the love and service of God? Okay? That's all that work. And here I would just ask you to do a little mental exercise. What do you think about most of the time during your week? Okay, right now we're here worshiping God. God love you for that. This is what we're supposed to do. Those other six days is what I'm asking about. What occupies your mind, your energies, everything else? And if it's your career, your family, these are good things, they're given to you by God, but are they oriented toward service and love of God? You have a family, good. You have children, that's a blessing. Are the children being raised to be saints? You have a career, that's good. Is it enough to support your family? And if you have anything else, how are you doing in the almsgiving category? I noticed, by the way, St. John the Bosco does not have a church. I'm just saying. So be generous. So we are stewards of the good things, not absolute owners. 
and we need to, to treat the, our good things as stewards. These are temporal things, and they're for a particular end. So just like the unjust steward who made friends with his ill-gotten gains, uh, when we take from our riches, however they've been acquired, and give alms, when we relieve the sufferings of the poor, uh, we, we are servants of God. And we hope that they might intercede for us. And in a final visual I'll give you, just remember your final end. Remember how it's going to end for all of us. Remember that at the end of all time, when everything gets summed up in Christ, what's going to happen? I'm quoting from St. Matthew 28. The Son of Man shall come in his majesty, with his majesty, and all the angels with him, and then he shall sit upon the seat of his majesty, and all the nations shall be gathered before him, and he shall separate them, one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he'll set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Okay. And then the king will say to them on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, possess the kingdom that's been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was naked, and you covered me, sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And of course, the just shall, shall say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty and, and feed you and give you drink or naked and clothe you? Or when did we visit you when, when you were sick or in prison? And he said, I assure you, when you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And then he's going to say to the goats on his left, I'm sorry for you all that you have received. <laughs> Just illustrate. But he'll say, he'll say, go ye to the fires that are prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was thirsty, you did not give me to drink. When I was hungry, you did not give me to eat. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. And they, for their turn, shall ask him, Lord, when did we see you in such a state and not aid you. And he'll say, when you failed to do this, for the least of my brethren, you failed to do it. So friends, all the riches we have, whether we can sit in, and whether we, they have dollar signs in front of them, or whether they're time, or a talent, or the resources of a family, they're temporal in nature, and they're made for a particular purpose. And so, when we leave here today, I would ask you to do this one mental exercise and think if God were to come to you tonight and demand of you an accounting of your stewardship of the gifts you've been given, would he find you desperately clinging to these temporal goods or would he find you open-handed praying for the graces that are all in the name of the Father and of the Son.